Okay, hi. Um, I'm Robert. I'm from your University Bochum, and I'm presenting our work on scalable scanning and automatic classification of TS padding oracle vulnerabilities. This joint work with the people you can see on the slide. Um, so before we start, I would like to get you all on the same page what this talk is about so that we uh, all can understand what I'm talking about later. So this talk is about TS. That's the protocol which you use in your browser, for example, if you make an HTTPS connection. And we are today trying to attack this protocol and, for example, steal a cookie to uh, break a user session. And the protocol itself consists of mainly two phases, a handshake phase and an application data phase. And in the handshake phase, the cryptographic algorithms are negotiated and the cryptographic keys, while the keys and algorithms are then used in the application data phase to actually encrypt the application data. And today we try to attack the application data so we can actually steal the cookies, for example. So TS uses this concept of cipher suit, so most of you probably know. But a cipher suit is a set of cryptographic algorithms which you can negotiate in a TS session. So this is an example cipher suit, and in this example, uh, we choose RSA as a key exchange algorithm. We use AES as a block cipher, and this block cipher is used in the uh, mode of operation CBC. And we use SHA-1 as an HMAC and in the pseudorandom function. So this talk is mainly about CBC padding oracles, so we will focus on all the cipher suits which use CBC. So if you are negotiating a cipher suit which is not CBC, you are not vulnerable, but if you do, you might be. So uh, let's talk about the CBC mode first. So this uh, TLS in CBC mode uses a concept of MAC, then pad, then encrypt. This means that your data is, f uh, if you have some data you want to encrypt, you first compute an HMAC, and then you have to fill this data up with additional padding bytes, so you had some padding. And depending on how long your padding is, your padding, look, uh, padding looks a little bit different. So for example, if you have one byte of padding, you just add a zero byte. If you have two bytes of padding, you just add two one bytes. And if you have three bytes, you add three two bytes, and so on. So there's this uh, structure in the padding. So after that, you put all your data into the CBC encryption function and then you get some ciphertext which, which you can then transmit. But uh, how does the CBC encryption look like? So ah, I have a CBC decryption here, sorry. So this is the decryption. Uh, so if you want to decrypt a block of ciphertext, what you can do is you can just uh, put it through a block cipher, and then you uh, compute the exclusive OR with some initialization vector, and then you get the resulting plain text. And if you have more than one by, uh, block of ciphertext, what you do is you use the previous block and XOR it with a result of a block cipher operation to get the next uh, place in text message block. And you continue with that till you get all the plain text message block. And eventually there will be some padding at the end of the message because the, uh, you have to fill the message up. So um, the CBC mode has an interesting property, meaning that it's uh, malleable. What does this mean? That if an attacker flips a bit in the cipher text, he will know that he will also flip the corresponding uh, bit in the plain text of the next block. So you can uh, inject arbitrary uh, bit flips in the plain text. So why is this problematic? Uh, what an attacker can do is he can just cut off, for example, the last part of a cipher text, and then suddenly the receiving server will interpret the message as padding. And this can get quite dangerous. So um, this is an example of a padding oracle where a server receives a malformed message from an uh, attacker. And what he can, uh, if a server uh, responds with, if, either if a message was invalid or if a message was valid, an attacker can deduce information about the plain text of a message. In this case, namely, that M2 acts on this modification from the attacker is a valid padding. And this can allow the attacker, if he uh, continues to send malform messages to the oracle, to decrypt the whole message. And this is obvi obviously bad, so we don't want that. So uh, why is this applicable in TS? So if you may have noticed, TS has an HMAC. So you would think, oh, if you manipulate the ciphertext, the HMAC gets invalidated. Um, this might be true, but uh, usually you cannot um, tell if the HMAC is valid or invalid before you have checked the padding. This is because uh, the HMAC is in an arbitrary position in this uh, plain text, and you have to check the padding to find out where the HMAC is before you can check it. So in TS, a vulnerable server actually uh, does not leak valid padding, invalid padding, but he leaks usually invalid HMAC, uh, invalid padding. So you can still deduce the information if the padding was 
valid or invalid. A secure server should always uh, respond the same way and should not give an attacker the opportunity uh, to know if a padding was valid or invalid. Uh, so this is actually an implementation vulnerability. It's not a vulnerability in the standard in TS. So there have been quite a few padding oracles in the past in TS, and I'm quickly going to talk about the various types. Um, so the first one is the Vaudenay padding oracle tech, and it's basically the first padding oracle tech on CVC mode and was uh, discovered in 2002. And it was originally not really exploitable in TS because in TS, if you uh, receive an error, like the HMAC was invalid, the connection is closed, and additionally, the error messages are encrypted, so even if a server sends uh, different error messages, you could not tell that, uh, the, uh, which error message you actually got. So, um, there were later improvements to this attack, which used timing to deduce the different error states and so on, uh, but this was the first uh, kind of this attack. And then later on, there was the Poodle attack, so maybe you have heard of this attack. Um, it's an attack against SSLv3, which is an early version of the TS protocol, and SSL version 3 has the vulnerability that it does not enforce the padding to be very strict, so you have a lot of freedoms in the other padding bytes you choose. And this can be exploited by an attacker. So what an attacker does, if he, uh, sees, is, uh, if he sees some re uh, message which looks like data HMAC padding, what he can do is he can transform this uh, message and cut off the padding bytes in the end and move a block from the plain text he wants to decrypt into the end. And the receiving server will interpret the data in the end as padding. And if this works and the HMAC is still valid, he knows, oh, um, he knows some information about the data. So this is quite dangerous, but this attack also affects some TS versions. So um, there's nothing in TS which forces a server to validate that each padding byte was actually valid. So the server can actually just uh, check the last padding byte and then just happily continue ever on and it worked perfectly fine without uh, any problems. But this can again be exploited uh, for the Poodle attack. So, um, this was actually found in a lot of implementations in the past, so there are many, many names for these attacks, and um, they are mostly, oftentimes, due to off by one errors, and what these attacks taught us, that you need to check each byte of the padding, and you also need to check each byte of the HMAC, so some implementations do not check all the HMAC bytes, which is quite weird, but uh, this, then this does happen. So, um, then I would like to talk about this CVE. This is an open SSL CVE from three years ago. And it was introduced uh, when we tried to fix the Lucky 13 attack, which I'm going to talk about later. And um, the problem here is that TS, TS allows you to do more padding bytes than you actually want, so, uh, need. So if you just need 13 uh, padding bytes and you use AES, you could also use 29 padding bytes. Yeah, the idea was that you could hide the length of a message with this feature. And this CVE taught us that you could also create uh, malformed messages which only contain padding, so they do not contain an HMAC at all. And this could uh, uh, then be exploited also in a padding oracle attack. So if your normal message looks like this, you could also construct messages which look like this, so they contain uh, two blocks of padding and an HMAC. And the receiver of such a message cannot tell that there's no data in it before he checked the padding. So you might be able to trick the implementation into showing different behavior. And it also taught us that you could do this. So you could uh, also uh, get rid of the HMAC and just send padding bytes. And the receiver has no possibility to tell before because um, he cannot check the HMAC. So this was quite dangerous, and um, there's another open SSL CV I want to talk about, which was quite surprising to me. It was from last year, and the important part of this CV is this year. So there was an implementation bug in some mem compare function, and it effectively reduced uh, to only comparing the least significant bit of each byte. And I was always like, okay, this is some weird architecture, so this is not affecting all the OpenSSL implementations, but I thought like, okay, I thought it does not matter which bit you uh, actually check. But uh, this uh, gave us the idea that you actually need to check that the implementation checks each bit because maybe they only check the most significant bits, maybe they choose to check the least significant bits, maybe they only chose to check those bits. So this was quite interesting for us. And uh, then I want to talk about the Lucky 13 attack. So the Lucky 13 attack is also a padding oracle attack. 
and it exploits a side channel which is actually present in the TS specification. And the core idea of the attack is that if you have longer padding, this might reside in a, a faster HMAC computation, and if you have shorter padding, this reside, might reside in a slower HMAC computation. The reason for this is that if the padding is longer, you actually have to HMAC less data, but if the padding is shorter, you have to HMAC more data, and this can result in this timing difference. So in order to fix this vulnerability, uh, you have to have a constant time implementation, which is quite hard to achieve in practice if you will still want to be re reasonably fast. So, but these timing attacks, uh, like in the Lucky 13, where you have to measure some HMAC computation timing, uh, is not relevant for this talk. So this is quite hard, as you can imagine. Um, there's a lot of room for errors because there's some network intolerances and so on. So we do not consider any timing at this level at all. So our timings are in the second range, so like 10 seconds or something. So you can see it with your bare eyes. Um, and finally, I want to talk about the robot attack. Um, the robot attack is not a CBC padding oracle vulnerability, but it's a Bleichenbacher vulnerability. It was presented last year at USNIX. And um, the interesting part for our research from this attack was that they found some new side channels. So they found that some servers do not show different error messages when you send invalid messages, but they actually show different behavior on the underlying layer, so on the TCP layer. So namely, they could see that some times the server was still leaving the TCP connection open, so he didn't close it. Other times, he normally closed the TCP connection with a TCP finished message, and other times, he terminated the connection with a TCP RST. So there are different interfaces you can call in the operating system to show these different behaviors. And this was quite nice, and we thought, oh, they might be also relevant for padding oracle vulnerabilities, CBC padding oracle vulnerabilities. So let's now talk about our research and padding oracles in the wild. So um, we know that these padding oracles are known since 2002, so there's quite a lot of time for developers and uh, engineers to uh, figure this attack out. But we asked us, uh, how common are they today in 2018, 2019? So our idea was, let's scan the Alexa top 1 million list and find out how many servers are actually vulnerable to this attack. But then we asked ourselves also, how, how would you actually do this? So there are quite a few ways to do this. So first off, what we want to know is which mail for messages should be sent. So as I've already introduced, there are multiple message formats which you could do. So with HMAC, without HMAC, only padding. Uh, you could flip different uh, bits and bytes in the padding. You could different, flip different bytes, bits and bytes in the HMAC. So we were not entirely sure which messages we should actually send. When we ask ourselves, uh, does it matter if we test different versions? So if a server is vulnerable on TS 1.2, is it also vulnerable on TS 1.0, or maybe the other way around? Or are there some, uh, some statistical properties here, or do we need to test actually everything? So are there servers which are only vulnerable on one version? Uh, the same for uh, block ciphers. So if you are vulnerable on triple DES, are you also vulnerable on AES? So in our minds, naturally, you would think probably yes, but we were not so sure. We have some indication that uh, this is actually not the case. And we asked ourselves, does it matter which key exchange algorithms you use? So usually it should be independent if you use RSA or elliptic curve diffie hellman If you are vulnerable in either, you should not be vulnerable in the other. Uh, or you should, if you are vulnerable in one, you should also vulnerable, be vulnerable in the other and the other way around. So, uh, but the robot paper had some indication that this is also not the case for all servers for Bleichmacher, so it might also not be the case for padding or CBC padding oracles. So what we did is we did some brainstorming session and we came up with different malform messages, uh, which I would like to present here. So the most trivial ones is this here. So it has some data, it has some, it has some HMAC, and it has some padding, and the padding is actually flipped uh, in the last position. And we created variations of this attack, so what we could find was bit flip uh, errors. So we flipped once a bit in the middle of the padding and once a bit in the uh, end of the padding. Or and uh, we also did the same for the HMAC, so maybe some implementations are not checking the entire HMAC, so we create ver variants of that too. And we also created uh, combinations of the two, so uh, some fl bit flip in the HMAC, some bit flip in the padding. When we came up with those special vectors, uh, which do not contain uh, application data, but they still do contain padding, and they are all actually the same length. So a receiver of such a mail from messages would not be able to tell if it's one of these messages or one of from the slide before, before it, can, uh, it has decrypted the message. 
when we came up with these two messages, so what we thought is, so maybe if there is not, uh, after you deep headed the message, there's not enough room for the complete HMAC, maybe some servers would leak different uh, behavior. And what we did is we removed the first byte of the HMAC and uh, once the last byte of the HMAC. So, uh, so there's par a partially valid HMAC in the record. And finally, we came up with those uh, malformed messages from the uh, CVE I talked about earlier, which contain only padding. And once where they only contain valid padding, and once where they contain only padding, but even that padding is invalid, so there's not enough room in the message to fit for whole padding. So we came up with 25 uh, malformed messages in total. Um, then we built a tool based on TS Attacker, which is a framework which was developed by URI in 2016 on, uh, for CCS. And it allows you to send arbitrary TLS messages with arbitrary TLS contents in an arbitrary order. And this is quite nice for us. So we developed this framework since three years now at our chair. So it's quite mature now. And based on our tool, we built on top of TLS Attacker, we built TLS Crawler, which is um, a distributed crawling infrastructure. I'm not going to go into the details because it's not very interesting, a lot of engineering just. And it's built on top of MongoDB and Redis to um, basically crawl a large amount of servers at the same time. So now I want to talk about some difficulties we had during scanning and how we tackled those problems. So first off, I want to talk about non-determinism. So uh, we had the problem that some servers, if you send a mail for message to them, they might respond with a bad record Mac, but if I send another mail for messages, you might get no response. So is the server vulnerable because we did not receive an answer yet? So maybe we should just wait longer, maybe it will answer eventually. So this is quite bad if you want to scan a large amount of servers. So what we did is we said, okay, we wait always one second after we send a mail for messages on whatever the server responded with, we will take as the answer from the server. So, but this still has a problem. Uh, it might be that the server was just on a high load and it eventually answers with a bad record Mac. So it's actually not vulnerable even after one second. So it's not a, a silver bullet here. So this confuses us if we want to say that the server is vulnerable or not. But even worse, we had servers which responded uh, to a mail from message A with a bad record Mac. And if you send the same message again, we suddenly get a different alert message. So uh, this makes it even worse for us and we are totally confused what we should say in this case. Is the server vulnerable? I don't know. So what we did is, um, what we believe the reason for this is that there's some content distribution network or some router or I don't know, uh, behind the scenes, which is actually distributing our packets to, and our handshakes to different servers. And these servers are uh, maintained in different configurations. So the one server might be not vulnerable and respond always with bad record Mac. The other server might be not vulnerable and always respond with record overflow, but we sometimes get this weird non-determinism in our scanning results, so it was quite bad. So if we think during the scanning process that the server is vulnerable, we rescan the server twice and we check that he responded on each and every message every time identical, and if he did this, we consider the server is actually vulnerable. And if it's not, uh, if it has some diff variance in its answers, we consider it as uh, not relevant for the study, so we exclude it. And we had another problem. So if you have 25 messages and you want to scan all the available cipher suits to find all the uh, possible vulnerabilities and um, maybe two supported versions, you end up with already a lot of handshakes you have to do for each server. And with a rescanning on vulnerable servers, which gets even worse, and if you want to scan the Alexa top 1 million list, which con may contain 1 million servers, you end up with a lot of handshakes. So what we ask ourselves, is this actually necessary to scan all the different cipher suits? Is it necessary to scan uh, with all 25 messages? Or maybe our messages are um, just bad and we did just choose them wrong. So we came up with them in a brainstorming session after all. And our solution was that we test 50,000 servers and check what is actually necessary to scan. So maybe we can cut some corners for the larger scan uh, of Alexa top 1 million list. So what we did is with, in this pre-scanning phase, we scanned with TS 1.0 and either TS 1.1 or TS 1.2 because they look uh, very similar. Uh, we scanned with all available CBC cipher suits from the server and we scanned with all the 25 mail from messages and check, for, uh, check the results for, uh, uh, yeah. So 
mm, from the result, it shows that, yes, you actually do need to check different TS versions. So some servers are only vulnerable on TS 1.2, but not vulnerable on TS 1.0. So uh, if we want to find all the vulnerabilities, we need to check that. Uh, block ciphers, yes, some servers are only vulnerable on triple DES, for example, and not on AES. Uh, um, and the other way around, but they still support the other modes. So this bad. And key exchange algorithms, sadly, yes. So, so there are some servers which are only vulnerable if you use AES, CBC, in RSA, but they are not vulnerable or if you use AES CBC on Ecliptic Curve Diffie Hellman. So if you want to find all the vulnerabilities, also a key exchange algorithms have to be scanned. And finally, uh, we looked at the messages which were required to find all the vulnerabilities. So if you, we would have sent only those four messages during the evaluation, uh, mm, we would s s still have found the same vulnerable servers. So, there's quite a lot of uh, improvement we can do here. So all the other messages are not entirely relevant if you just want to know if a server is vulnerable or not. So when we get, uh, went to scanning the Alexa top one million list with exactly this configuration, so all the cipher suits, uh, two sets of versions, and uh, uh, these four, uh, four mail from messages and looked at the results. So this took us roughly 72 hours with all the rescanning. And roughly 78% of the servers responded on port 443. So they wanted to speak TS with us. And from both servers, at, uh, at least 1.83% are considered vulnerable by us. So they responded identically to three rescans, the same, uh, and they were vulnerable on all three of them in the exact same way. And this is quite a lot for 2018, 2019, so 17 year old vulnerability. So what we ask ourselves is, um, how many actually different vulnerable implementations did we hit? So is this all just one vulnerable implementation, or are there actually multiple implementations at work? So what we then did is we fingerprinted all the vulnerable servers in a way with, where we sent all the 25 mail from messages and created some sort of fingerprint which you, we could use to compare the vulnerabilities. So um, these fingerprints look like this. So for on, in this example, on the left side, you can see the message we sent, and on the right side, you can see the response from the server. So in this case, it responded with a bad record MAC and a TCP fin. And if you add all the other messages, you suddenly get something like this, and you can see that the, the server is actually vulnerable because it has a behavior difference. So it responds different to our mail from messages, so an attacker can observe this also. Uh, in this case, with a record overflow. So in total, we found 93 different vulnerable fingerprints. So if you assume that there's no possibility in implementation to change your fingerprint, because uh, why would there? This means that there are likely 93 different vulnerable implementations deployed in Valexa top 1 million. So this was quite bad, but uh, we wanted to cluster these vulnerabilities even more. So we've discovered that some servers are not vulnerable in the same way, even if they have the same vulnerable fingerprint. So in this example, all the servers have the same vulnerability fingerprint. So they all respond to the same mail for messages in the exactly the same way, but they are not vulnerable on all the cipher suits they support. In this example, server A is only vulnerable on AES 256 CBC SHA, and it is not vulnerable on triple DES, but it supports triple DES. Server B is vulnerable on both cipher suits, and server C is only vulnerable on AES 256, but it does not support triple DES, so we could not test if he's vulnerable or at all. So what do we know from this? So we know that server A is clearly not server B, because you cannot configure your triple DES implementation to not be vulnerable, so they are likely using a different implementation. And we also know that A could be the same server as server C, and B could be the same server as server C, so they are not contradicting each other. So what we did is to find even more vulnerabilities is we uh, ran some clustering. So what we did is we draw some uh, graph where each node in the graph uh, is a server we scan for, and when we drew an edge between uh, these nodes, if a server could be the same implementation, so if they could not be, no edge, if they could be the same, they all drew an edge. So then we asked ourselves, okay, there are quite a lot of servers, how do you actually visualize this? So uh, to do this, we used uh, the Gephi software, which is a graph software which you can manipulate large graphs and the Force Atlas 2 algorithm. Uh, the Force Atlas 2 algorithm is a simulation-based uh, graph drawing algorithm. So what it does is it runs some sort of physical simulation where each uh, nodes re generally repulse each other, while edges uh, force the nodes to attract each other. 
And then it just um, lets the weights uh, run out and there's some distribution. And this is what I'm actually going to show you now, uh, how this looks like. So uh, this is the Gephi software and here are, is our graph. And as you can see, you can see not a lot because there are a lot of edges and a lot of nodes, but you can actually pull them aside so you get an idea of how many uh, edges there are. And what I want to do now is I want to color these nodes so that we can actually see a little bit more. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to color these nodes based on their degree, so uh, based on their number of edges. So all the, uh, the nodes which have the same number of edges get the same color. And I can do this like this. And suddenly you can still see not quite a lot, but a little bit more. Uh, but now you can run the force atlas 2 algorithm, and I'm actually going to run it slow motion uh, because it looks quite cool if you do this. Uh, <laughs> um, but it will actually cluster the vulnerabilities for us, so I'm going to start this now. And you get something like this. So as you can see, this is a physical simulation, sort of, so you can see, still see some movement, so it will never stop to uh, wiggle around. But uh, what we can actually see is that there are uh, at least two big groups of servers, and um, I'm going to analyze them now on the slides back again. So. Okay, so this is basically our example. I just rotated it and shows different colors. Um, and what you can see is that the top group, so the green group, is actually the ones which is vulnerable on both cipher suits, while the tier group between the two bigger groups is the ones which are only vulnerable on triple desk. So they could be in either group, so either the big green group or the purple group. So they have edges with both, so they are torn apart by those larger groups. And the group below is, um, uh, not vulnerable on AES, it's only vulnerable on triple desk, so it, it clearly is not the same implementation as the green group, uh, but, but it could be the same as the tier group. And also there's the one, uh, some servers in red, you, and at the bottom you can see, so they are red because they have a different degree, because they do not share um, edges with the tier group, so they are very likely uh, purple, but they are very likely not tier. So um, you can use this information now um, to pick the biggest sites of each group and to contact the vendor to try to ask them politely if they tell you which implementation is responsible for this. So now let me talk quickly about exploitability. So um, uh, a big factor of uh, if you're actually vulnerable to this attack and it's actually exploitable is the fact if it's uh, observable. So, uh, this is an example of a, a vulnerable server, so it sometimes responds with a bad record Mac, sometimes responds with record overflow, but in TS in general, uh, those alert messages, uh, we, during the scanning process, we have the keys for, the, for those uh, messages, so we can decrypt them, but not during the exploitation phase, so if we had the keys, we could also decrypt the message. So we have to uh, see this difference without having the keys, so what we actually see is we see two encrypted alerts, and we as an attacker have to differentiate them, so it's not uh, trivial in some cases. Um, but in other cases, we actually get some side channel. For example, this case, we get uh, two encrypted alerts in both cases, but sometimes we get a, a, a TCP fin, and sometimes we get uh, none. So in this case, it's clearly for an attacker, he can just scan and sh look at the behavior of a server, and then uh, he knows if he receives a fin, the padding was, uh, what was it, a record overflow, and in the other case, it was a bad record make. So uh, this can be exploited by an attacker, so this is observable, we call this. And there are other cases where you have something like this, so sometimes you get only one alert or two alerts. This is also clearly observable by, by an attacker. He does not need imperfect side channels to uh, deduce if, uh, if the padding was valid or invalid. He can directly see this. So if you open Wireshark, you can also see this. So there's no, no sub nanosecond side channel or something. So um, then we classified our padding oracles in different groups, namely weak, strong, and poodle oracles. So the Poodle oracles uh, usually do not check all the padding bytes of uh, malformed messages, and, but they still require a valid HMAC. So if you would want to exploit them, you would need to run some Poodle-style attack. So it always differs a little bit depending on the exact vulnerability, but this is your general attack strategy here. And uh, they are definitely exploitable because the Poodle or uh, attack actually works. So um, this is definitely true. And then there's the strong uh, oracle, so these can be exploited with a classic uh, padding oracle, as you would see it in a textbook. 
So um, there's no, not much magic here. But then there's the weak oracles. And the weak oracles uh, oftentimes require more than one block of padding to, be, uh, to show this behavior difference. And if you want to exploit this, this can get quite problematic, as I want to show you now. So when I showed you this graphic, where I showed you that an attacker can introduce bit flips, I actually lied quite a, a little bit. So maybe you have seen it. Because if an attacker flips a bit in C1, he also flips the plain text uh, of message M1 to something completely random, which he cannot control. And this makes it quite hard for the attacker to construct all um, arbitrary uh, mail messages uh, from a, an HTTP request. So um, and this is just one example. So sometimes this attacker is limited in a way to create this mail messages, which create. Uh, show the behavior difference, so we call these oracle weak oracles, and we consider them not exploitable because they oftentimes allow you only to reduce, uh, to decrypt one block of plain text or something, and not consecutive blocks. So in total, we consider a server to be, a, a padding oracle to be exploitable if it's either a poodle or strong oracle, and it is observable. So an attacker does not need any additional side channels or tricks uh, to see the behavior difference. And from our scanning, we could show that 61.4% of the vulnerable servers are actually observable, so most of them. And in total, 57% 57, uh, 57 of the vulnerable hosts are practically exploitable. So they are uh, either a poodle oracle or a strong oracle, and they are also observable. So uh, let me go to our findings now. So. Um, we found quite a few CVEs. So uh, we found open vulnerabilities in OpenSS, Citrix, F5, SonicWall, Oracle, and uh, we could not attribute all our vulnerabilities. So we politely asked the website owners if they could tell us which implementations they used, but sometimes they told us, sometimes they didn't. And then we cooperated with the vendors to uh, actually fix the get a fix for the vulnerability. And the most prominent one is here, the OpenSSL vulnerability, and it was, um, actually found with the uh, uh, help of the Amazon security team. And this vulnerability is very special because we obviously scanned OpenSSL before in a lab setting. So we actually uh, checked and it was not vulnerable because there's an example application with OpenSSL which we tested and everything was fine. So we were quite surprised when uh, Amazon told us that this is actually OpenSSL which was vulnerable. And the problem is, um, but OpenSSL responds differently if you uh, use the API in a certain unintended way. So um, this is how we saw the OpenSSL vulnerability. So uh, you, may, you may be able to spot the vulnerability. So as you can see, the response from the servers, there's the TCP finished message missing. Um, the messages which do not contain application data, but uh, do contain valid padding, but an invalid HMAC. So it's a Poodle style vulnerability. And uh, this is quite bad, but there might be other vulnerabilities which just show to us differently because depending on the application, uh, they might respond a little bit differently, but the general pattern is the same. So during the disclosure process, we notified uh, the biggest sites and uh, uh, tried to uh, get those problems resolved. And as you can see, we were quite unsuccessful with that. So from five reports, we got two no response or they just didn't care. And we have two times we get um, non-applicable, which means uh, you get negative points. You should not bother them with uh, such a text again. And actually, only one side uh, 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 fixed uh, fix the vulnerability by disabling CBC cipher suits, and they gave us seven points. So in total, we got uh, minus, minus three points on Hacker One. So <laughs> if you also want um, to get minus points on Hacker HackerOne, um, you can download our tool, TS Scanner. It's on GitHub. Uh, you can also check for padding Oracle vulnerabilities, and maybe you can help attribute those vulnerabilities, because there are certainly a lot of vulnerabilities which are not attributed yet. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a demo of this tool, so you get an idea how this looks like. So um, yeah, I have uh, OpenSSL in an old vulnerable version, so it's not the vulnerability we found, but uh, it works quite well in this demo. And on the left side, uh, you can see our tool TS scanner, and what I'm going to do, it's written in Java, so excuse me, but um, what you can do is you specify to which server you want to connect, so I'm running localhost, so I'm scanning that. And when I say I want a detailed uh, report, so we can actually look at the padding oracle vulnerability. 
So if I run this, it uh, will take some time because I'm running it in single-threaded mode because um, I do not want to overwhelm the single-threaded OpenSSL server with uh, requests. And after some time, we should get a report if the server is vulnerable or not. So let's wait some seconds. Yeah, it's quite a lot of handshake here, too. Okay, actually, I think I'm not going to let it run to the end. I think it takes like two minutes. Um, but I, what I'm going to show you is this here. Uh, so this is the finished report. So um, so it gets a lot of noisy input because there are a lot of uh, cipher suits. So you can see basic information from the tool, like which cipher suits it support, similar to other TS scanners. And it also reports you about the um, Vulnerable, vulnerabilities for servers, and as you can see, this one has a lot of vulnerabilities, but for us, the most interesting one is this here, and it's vulnerable to padding oracles, that's true. And what you can see is, oh, it could not identify which server this here was that I scanned, and show you something like this. So you can see the different cipher suits we scan for, you can see the different version we scan for, and you can see if we found a different behavior difference. So in this case, RSA, uh, IDEA and CBC mode seems not to be vulnerable, but if you look here, uh, there's an AES cipher suit, and it's actually vulnerable because it says you can differentiate the alert message contents, so it's vulnerable, and what you can see below is the actual uh, response fingerprint we got. So uh, on the left side, there's this uh, graphics I showed you before, encoded in some strings, and on the right side, you can see the actual responses. So to most messages, it responded with a bad record MAC alert, and it, uh, the MAC uh, alert was encrypted, and then it closed the connection uh, with a TCP fin. But for these two records, it uh, responded with a record overflow, and uh, also closed the connection. So it's not observable, but it's uh, definitely vulnerable. Okay, I think, do I have time for another demo, or uh, I think I skipped that. So, so let me come now to our contributions and conclusions. So we found 93 different uh, vulnerabilities in the Alexa Top 1 million. We tried to responsibly disclose our uh, findings as good as possible to the affected vendors and websites. And we released open source tools so that you can actually uh, reproduce our research and uh, find the vulnerabilities yourself. So in conclusion, uh, I hopefully I convinced you that large-scale scans can help to uncover new vulnerabilities which do not show in lab settings because actual servers sometimes use the software in a different way. And uh, what I also want to emphasize is that CBC uh, with an Mac encrypt scheme is really, really hard to implement correctly. So it has to be side channel free completely. It has to be constant time. It's quite hard. And so maybe it's time for us as a community to remove CBC support entirely from the client software as well as from the server software. And with that, I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Okay, if you have any questions, please come to the micro and uh, maybe introduce yourself. And so, I'm John Kelsey. Hi, Hi nice to meet you. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to ask, you said that there were 93 different fingerprints that yeah. you found. It's hard for me to imagine that there are really 93 entirely different implementations of TLS. Maybe that's just me being naive. I'm a cryptographer, I'm not a software guy. Yeah. but. I was kind of wondering, if, it sounds like you found an instance where just the same toolkit was being used slightly different ways mm. that was giving you, like mm. with OpenSSL. I was wondering if you think that, you know, where you think this large number comes from. Like, could it be yeah. hardware, you know, like I know sometimes you'll have assembly language implementations for different hardware, and it seems like that's a place where you could get very different behavior. But yeah. So I think the most probably uh, reason for this is there's a long history of TS versions. So even if you run a, a now secure version, uh, maybe you run an older version of that same one, which is vulnerable, maybe the vulnerability changed among different versions. But the most thing I learned uh, just recently is that there are some vendors which have multiple products in combination. 
So they have some web application firewall and some servers, and maybe both are vulnerable, and they uh, produce some weird combination oh, wow. of uh, vulnerability. And this is why we sometimes see those, uh, those large numbers. But uh, if we, you would look at the distribution of our vulnerabilities, uh, most servers have the same vulnerabilities. So there are like 10 prominent ones or something. And then there's a large number of vulnerabilities which are only affected by four servers or something. All right, thanks. I don't have any question. I just spotted your mistake on one of the slides. Can you go to the results slide? E excuse me, can you, can you speak up? Uh, sorry, I don't have a question, but I just spotted your mistake in your, one of your slides. Can you go to the results slide? To which slide? Results. The narrating the results you are talking about, right? Uh, the previous one, yeah. The third one, 6493, is probably is not a FICVE. I think it's 6593. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have to correct it on our website. <laughs> <laughs> if there is also there. Okay, thank you. Uh, please thank Robert again.